Okay, so today I wanted to do a video about the book Clinical Honorology by this gentleman right here. So you can read that. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce his name. I'll just refer to the author as he. I have a feeling I would butcher it and I don't want to embarrass myself. So, <laughs> um, I'm only about halfway through the book so far and just some of my first impressions. Um, it is not the easiest read. Um, the person who wrote it is, you know, is a psychiatrist and obviously very highly educated. And the vocabulary that he uses for someone who is a layperson when it comes to psychiatry um, is, you know, not the easiest to <laughs> put together. Um, but I still have found the book to be very enjoyable, um, and it definitely has a lot of important ideas in it, and I think it's definitely worth the effort um, to read it and understand it. Just to give a little bit of an idea about what the book is about, I'm going to read uh, from one of the critics in the front of the book. And she says, After I read the book, a number of nagging questions about the policies and practices of government and corporate officials began to answer themselves, and that his analysis goes to the heart of why the United States government has become a criminal enterprise, hell-bent on dominating the world and annihilating vast quantities of human beings globally and domestically. Political ponderology is an invaluable work that every human being striving to become conscious become conscious should read, not only for its expose of the pathology of the individuals currently in control of the United States government, but also the light it may shed on individuals close to home, some of whom may, whom may be friends, fellow activists, business, or civic leaders. The book's purpose is to cultivate discernment and buttress our trust of innate intuition in order to navigate the daunting manifestations of evil that surround us in the 21st century. And that's a quote from Carolyn Baker, psychotherapist, professor of history and psychology, and author of Sacred Demise, Walking the Spiritual Path of Industrial Civilization's Collapse. Okay, so some of the things that I've taken away from the book in particular, um, a lot of the evil that is in the world um, is the result of people who are uh, mentally ill, and by that I mean they, you know, have some sort of chemical hormonal imbalance that causes them to um, behave in a, in a way that's lacking in empathy and cruel toward other people. They may have, you know, some sort of brain damage that makes empathy um, impossible for them to feel. And a lot of evil also is the result of um, evil that has built up over time in social and political institutions. Um, you know, the government, the law, um, financial institutions, etc. And one of the big things that I thought about reading the book um, and thinking about the tendency of, of people to engage in psychological projection. Um, people who are very uh, judgmental and dismissive and other, of others um, have a tendency toward being predatory. It makes sense that those individuals would be the, you know, some of the first ones to seek power over other people because they're going to assume that everybody else is a predator like them. And that if they're not out trying to get one over on other people, that that's just going to leave them open to be victimized and to be controlled and dominated by others. And so the result of that is that um, sociopaths end up infiltrating, you know, any high, powerful, institutions, um, and unfortunately a lot of people have a tendency to revere authority and follow authority um, 
even if that institution has become an agent of evil, um, people are blinded to the, the evil that their governments do, the evil that maybe their their bosses do, their parents do, their you know other family members. Um, and as evil builds up in society too, um, and becomes more and more dysfunctional, it sort of gives people an even greater incentive to cower and stick their heads in the sand because the task of confronting it becomes more and more daunting. But unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, um, there's only a certain amount of evil that can exist in society before society completely collapses. And it's just the, the self-destructive nature of evil. And, you know, I've thought about this when it comes to, like, the show Once Upon a Time. I mean, I think um, that show really makes you think about good versus evil. And, um just how uh, lonely that evil ultimately can be because um, it, it becomes so dominating at some point that you can't let any good things in. And um, once all the good is driven out, I mean, there's, there's just, uh, there's nothing but death and darkness and and I think unfortunately that you know societies he talks about in the book have a tendency to um, go through very dark times and people are forced to become more guarding against evil and more psychologically healthy in dealing with evil um, because they have no other choice um, they have to in order to survive. And then, unfortunately, after a few generations of better and better times, people, um, th there's a greater toleration for laziness and selfishness, um, conditions that aren't really possible when society is at such a low point. Um, you know, that you're just surviving hand to mouth um, day to day. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of the problem with the good, if you will, that is that um, when good I guess, do is, is more dominant in society, it uh, more or less enables people to be lazy and be selfish and take advantage of other people in ways that isn't possible when you're existing at a subsistence level and, and civilization is, has been destroyed by the, the last cycle of corruption and evil to, to lay waste to the land, so to speak. Um, okay, so that's just one thing uh, he when he talks in the book about the evil in civilization he really talks about how the United States in particular is at a uh, a brink where where he feels that we're we're on the verge of collapse due to too high of a toleration of evil in our in our social and our political institutions and I would like to think that <laughs> we can avoid uh, a really horrible, you know, nuclear holocaust or, you know, another Great Depression, you know, some really horrible um, thing that's going to just cause a lot of unnecessary death and uh, grief to a lot of people. But um, if history is any indication, I would say that it's, it's it's definitely something that people need to um, start working at if, if we do have any hope to 
to turn things around and to uh, stop the snowball downhill. <laughs> uh, I think our society in general now promotes um, poor mental health and um, it's already to a point where people um, aren't going to be able, I think, too much longer to stick their head in the sand and pretend that we don't have serious problems and that we can just continue on our current course without self-destructing. Um, one thing I thought about, ironically, I guess, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe it's not ironic, but I thought about the the passage in the Bible, um, John 3:16. I often, especially with the New Testament, try to sort of interpret biblical verses in ways, in different ways, that they can be helpful to me, even being an atheist and not really buying into a lot of the Christian dogma, and I think one way you could interpret John 3.16 um, is to say that, it's trying to say that to love the world is to be willing to sacrifice for the world and work hard so that, um, not just so that you have a good life, but so that the people around you can have a good life too, and that selfishness and laziness breed more of the same, and that's another reason why um, service is important, and I think only goodness provides everlasting life, only uh, being to in, in the service of other people, not just thinking about yourself, and that's really I don't really believe in an afterlife, but I do believe that good deeds and evil deeds, but in particularly good deeds, can provide life to um, future generations, um, inspiration, and you know, I the thing about good is that it it's constructive and and builds on itself. Um, in a way that evil just doesn't do, because evil builds on itself too, but it also um, undermines itself at the same time. And I guess in a way you could say the same about good in the whole breeding, uh, selfishness and laziness kind of a thing. Um, I think, you know, it's important to be vigilant when it comes to evil. Um, I think the the best thing for evil is to uh, feel self-righteousness and, it, you know, the people that tend to be the most self-righteous, um, surprise, surprise, tend to um, be the most likely to follow along um, when authority figures lead us down a dark path. Um, and uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about um, is the military-industrial complex in America, because I, you know, you can't help thinking about that, and um, when you read this book, in terms of one of the things causing America, I feel, to slide downhill is the fact that we put so much. Um, money and energy into our military. Uh, I used to live in a military town and I don't anymore. I lived there for about, hmm, about seven or eight years. And one thing you don't, I, I didn't really realize to the extent that I do now when I was living there is it's makes, living in a military town makes the the presence of the military industrial complex and the role that it plays in our society 
Um, it makes it impossible to ignore. And you feel, uh, I felt, I don't know if I'm particularly sensitive, you know, compared to most people or what, but I felt, living in a military town, I felt like there was a constant state of tension in the air, and it's overwhelming. Um, and then not living there anymore, and then going back, you know, I really feel it so strongly, but when you live there, you get numbed to it, and you don't even recognize that it's there. And you can kind of see the presence of the military industrial complex in your regular life when you don't live in a military town, um, but it's like somebody took the dial of a radio and turned it down, you know, about, <laughs> you know, about to just a fraction of what it was. Um, you know, clearly, I, th I think our military has overextended itself in terms of all the countries that we're in. Um, I, I really feel like our forces have, are stretched too thin. Um, I feel like we, we invest too many of our resor resources um, in building industrial bases and um, sending troops, you know, all over the world. You know, it's expensive. And I'm not sure what it is that we're getting out of it, um, you know, the average citizen anyway. I think that politicians and big corporations are benefiting from that a lot more than the average person is. And that's something that I think people should be aware of. Um, you know, people are always complaining about how things like, you know, social, social Security and Medicaid and disability, how those are um, a drain on our economy. But I really do feel like um, the military industrial complex is too, and that you know, we need to recognize that. And, it, and it's not being disloyal to the military or not caring about military families, it's just being um, realistic. So, anyway, thank you for watching my video. Have a great day.